Our dirty commies are weak. We'll talk about that. The FBI is evil. We'll talk about that. Street communism in America, an update on the Supreme Court. So much tonight on I'm Right. Let me give you some good news. We're going to go to Julio Rosas here in just, just a minute and talk about what's happening in New York, what's happening everywhere else. But before we do that, let me give you some good news. There's enough bad news out there. The good news is American communists are soft. You see, the communists of old, as much as I hate them, Stalin, Mao, they really were tough guys. Stalin spent his youth shooting people and robbing banks. Mao... Did you know he taught some of our troops jungle warfare in China prior to World War II? Mao's a jungle, fight, jungle fighter, a tough guy. Our communists are not. They know how to talk like one. They're not that tough, though. Do you see this dirty little commie in Bakersfield, California, threatening the city council? Hi there, my name is Riddhi Patel. I'm here to speak in support of the city council introducing a ceasefire resolution, specifically the one um, United Liberation Front um, has drafted. I don't have faith that you'll do this. You guys are all horrible human beings and Jesus probably would have killed you himself. And while you, you guys parade Gandhi around as a Hindu holiday called Chaitra Navratri, it starts off this week. I remind you that these holidays that we practice, that other people in the global south practice, believe in violent revolution against their oppressors. And I hope one day somebody brings the guillotine and kills all of you mother Regardless of whether you elect people into office, they'll backstab you, they'll let you die, and for that reason, you guys want to criminalize us with metal detectors, we'll see you at your house. We'll murder you. That's against the law. You know, she knows how to talk like Mao, but apparently she didn't know that there come with consequences, you see. This was her, just like... 24 hours later, after the police tracked her down, threw her in handcuffs, and informed her that she was facing multiple felony charges. You see, the American communist was not raised in the jungles of China or the Siberian hinterlands of Russia. The American communist was born, bred, and nurtured in America's university system, and therefore the American communist is soft. If we would just nudge him, he would fall right over. And places like Florida, you try to block traffic, you get nudged. That's weird. Law enforcement getting these rabid street communists out of the way. What conditions would allow police to do such things? Joining me now, my friend Julio Rosas joined his substack is called Mostly Peaceful. Okay, Julio, who were those cops and where did they get this dangerous authority to get people out of the road? Yeah, it's kind of an unusual uh, sightseeing these days. So that was in Miami, in the great state of Florida. And obviously, with the way that law enforcement is able to actually do their jobs, it's no surprising that uh, they were the the, the anti-Israel, pro-Hamas, pro-Palestine protesters were quickly removed from the streets. I was in New York City yesterday uh, covering this widespread mobilization that was advertised for weeks, uh, trying to disrupt the economy on tax day uh, so that uh, our tax dollars don't go to help fund uh, you know Israel and all, and all that. So uh, as, as, as good as what happened in Florida was, uh, it was a rarity because uh, in New York, traffic was congested from Manhattan to Brooklyn. We saw O'Hare uh, Airport in Chicago that that was blocked off for a couple of uh, for a little bit of time because of these protesters the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, and, and that was just the main roadways. There was other kind of these small uh, small unit uh, actions that were being taken all across the country, again, with this aim of trying to disrupt the economy. Okay, Julio, I want to nail down on this aspect of what we saw yesterday, because you just brought it up, New York, O'Hare, Golden Gate Bridge, whatnot. 
the organization, because it hit me yesterday as I watched how widespread this was. This is not random. People didn't wake up and organize on Facebook that day and run down to New York City City Hall. What? Who organized this? What? Why? Who funded it? Who, who were the groups behind this? Where did this come from? So there's a there's a website called a15.org, and that was kind of this umbrella type organization. They 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 encourage basically the the local groups in, in any of the cities to take autonomous action to try to uh, have this economic blockade. And so the the people behind a15.org is actually a little bit. A little bit shrouded in mystery. There, you know, there, there's no names behind it. You know, there's no about us <laughs> section uh, listing out who's in charge of that. And, and so um, they 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 really just hammered in the point that uh, they wanted all these groups uh, that in New York City it was within our lifetime. Uh, th there's all these different. There was a, this thing called the dissenters in Chicago that, that were, those were the kind of the people that were kind of behind the O'Hare action. Um, it 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 was just kind of what we what we've been seeing the past couple of years where uh the, this kind of loose coalition within the far left that uh you know their tactics might be a little bit different they they might have not agree entirely on on a specific issue although i would say that they're pretty unanimous on how they view israel and the war in gaza um just to try to you know, uh, make things as painful as possible for the average American to, in order to, to, because people have been asking, well, why are they doing this? They're going to make people angry. And I've been saying since day one, since October 8th, is that these people aren't trying to convince you. They're just trying to make your life as miserable as possible so that you just give in to their demands. Julio, you mentioned these people in the Gaza, Israel, Palestine thing. Are these people all Muslim activists? Is this a religious thing for them? Are they just far left dirtball commies? I'm asking because are these the same faces you've encountered at these random protests for as long as you've been covering them? You were at all the BLM, Antifa stuff with the street animals out there. Are these the same animals? Uh, depending on location, but generally, yes. I mean, uh, Dearborn, Michigan, obviously, the, with the large Muslim population over there, th that is going to be mostly a religious aspect to it. Uh, but here or over there in New York City and Chicago, uh, it, it's basically kind of the same thing because it's kind of the same groups that were involved with kind of allying with BLM back in 2020. And so uh, that's why it kind of had to take a different uh, big event like October 7th to kind of galvanize and get them motivated to uh, willing to get back out into the streets again. And, and New York City has been hit particularly hard uh, by the far left uh, since since October 7th. I mean, they have disruptive events basically every week, at least at least once a week. Um, they're, you know, it's actually very rare for them to not have something of some kind. Um, and so uh, that, that's why when there was this kind of call to action to disrupt, that's why they went around Wall Street, right, to, to just try to figure out a way of how to, you know, not, and look, obviously I'm not a fan of paying taxes either, but uh, obviously they're taking it to a little bit of an extreme. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of the same actors, kind of the same uh, rhetoric, uh, basically, you know, even though obviously their, their main target is Israel, they, they also hate the United States. They hate, is they hate cops. They, they were always, uh, they're always getting into fights with them. They're always trying to antagonize uh, people that don't, that happen to be by that don't that don't follow their ideology. So um, we'll, we'll see how this plays out as the election heats up. Um, and, I, and we can expect that uh, the DNC in Chicago later this summer is going to be pretty, uh, pretty eventful. Julio, speaking of the cops, wrapping this up here, when people are on the outside looking in, when I'm not in San Francisco, I'm not in New York City, they look and they ask, many people ask the same question, why aren't the cops doing anything? You know, when you're blocking off the Golden Gate Bridge, why are the cops not throwing everyone in the back of a paddy wagon? When you're storming City Hall, why is everybody not getting a face full of pepper spray and some handcuffs? What holds the cops back in these places? It's because of 2020. Um, you know, one of the things back then was defunding the police. And while that was successful initially, a lot of, uh, a lot of money has been poured back into these police departments. But the issue now is just that they're, they're undermanned and they're, uh, they're handcuffed by these policies being put forth uh, by these far left radicals in whatever uh, government, whether it's city or state. And so 
um, you would think, yes, you know, if you're going to endanger people and basically hold them hostage for hours on end on a bridge, um, but it, it, it's they're, you know, the the cops aren't going to necessarily uh, kind of have the authority anymore to 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 take care of these people pretty quickly. I, I, you know, it did. I think it was like something like five hours, or you know, at least it was a couple of hours, and and then of course you know the Seattle too. So, so it, it just it's very unfortunate, and and this is kind of the 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 uh, continuing effects of the of the mass lawlessness that we saw in 2020. So um, even though the police departments haven't been defunded, um, the the far left was pretty successful in hamstringing police departments across the country, as as we're seeing now. Yeah, they sure were. Julio, thank you, brother. Appreciate it as always. All right, we have. So much to get to. There was something big happening today in the Supreme Court, and surprise, surprise, Julie Kelly was all over it. We will discuss things with her in just a moment before we do that. Speaking of crime, are you ready? Are you ready to encounter a violent criminal? They're out there. They're all around us. Look, you want a little extra motivation? Right now, go to your state's sex offender registry and put in your zip code. Oh, not in my town. Put in your zip code. Does your wife carry something on her that will allow her to stop a bad man? Does your son? Does your father? That's what the burn a pistol launcher is all about. This is non-lethal. Therefore, it's legal in all 50 states. I carry lethal and non-lethal. I believe in carrying both. You don't need a permit. You don't need a background check. No matter where you live, they will mail it to your front door. They shoot these pepper balls or tear gas balls. They'll incapacitate a very bad man. 40 minutes. You're gone, free, not in jail, and alive. Go get a Burna pistol launcher. SWAT teams across the country use these things. They're sick. B-Y-R-N-A. Burna.com slash Jesse. Own your own self-defense, all right? We'll be back. Well, there's a lot going on today in the legal world, in the political world. It's hard to keep track of all that, and I'm certainly too stupid to do that. So that's why I rely on people like Julie Kelly, who's all over this stuff. The Supreme Court met today, and there was all this fa fancy legal mumbo-jumbo, habeas corpus, or whatever, how these people talk. Joining me now, Julie Kelly. Go subscribe to her Substack called Declassified. Julie, what happened today with the writs and habeas corpus and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and the mens rea and the actus rea. I'm yes. not smart either, but yes. I'm picking up on all these legal terms. So, um, right. so today was finally a long awaited hearing of the government's abuse, DOJ's abuse of 1512C2, obstruction of an official proceeding. This was a statute that was passed in the aftermath of the Enron Arthur Anderson accounting scandal uh, that the government, this DOJ, uh, Merrick Garland and Matthew Graves, the DCUS attorney have weaponized, intentionally misinterpreted the language to instead apply it to political protesters, only those though, Jesse, who were involved in the events of January 6th. More than 350 defendants have been charged over the past three years with 1512C2. It's a felony punishable by up to 20 years in prison. Many uh, defendants who have pleaded guilty or been convicted have been sentenced to years in prison on this nonviolent obstruction count. So the Supreme Court finally gave this uh, practice, uh, this approach, a long delayed scrutiny. And uh, a majority of the justices were extremely skeptical as to how the DOJ has interpreted it, applied it, and how it, more importantly, Jesse, would not apply to many of the political protests that we've seen in recent years, in recent months, and even ongoing as we speak this week. Julie, what specifically, which, which prisoners are going to benefit from this? And I, I, I know this is a really stupid question, but I'm concerned about all of them. Are all of them potentially going to get lighter sentences or maybe no sentences because of this? Is this be for one specific guy and the rest of them are screwed? How's this work? So what's important to know, Jesse, is that this felony count usually becomes the animating charge in determining how long a defendant will go to prison unless they have attacked a police officer in addition to this 1512 obstruction count. But otherwise, if they're charged with obstruction, civil disorder, and these common misdemeanors, 
This obstruction count really dictates how long an individual will go to prison. And this is what the judges base sentencing prison sentences on. Without this count, a majority, overwhelming majority, who have been charged or convicted with 1512C2 would only spend maybe 12 months, eight months in prison for misdemeanors. Even with a civil disorder charge, it could go up to 18 months. Instead, they're being they're being sentenced to three, four, five years in prison on this. Jacob Chansley, as you know, the most famous insurrectionist, we joke, uh, he was sentenced to 41 months in prison for pleading guilty to this obstruction count. It has been very destructive. So actually, some judges, Jesse, are already releasing from prison people who have been sent to jail on this 1512 C2 count, predicting or anticipating that the Supreme Court will reverse it. And in other cases that are pending, either plea deals, can, uh, jury trials, or sentencing hearings, they've all been delayed until the Supreme Court renders an opinion. And it did look today that a majority will reverse and overturn how this DOJ has abused the statute. And Jesse, this should result in some repercussions of the DOJ prosecutors and more than 17 federal judges in Washington who have signed off on the abuse of this vague statute to punish Americans who protested Joe Biden's election on January 6th. Julie, you mentioned the Supreme Court looks like they're leaning towards overturning it, and that's wonderful. What were the highlights from today? I wasn't sitting in there. Did the dirty commies do something stupid? They usually do. And who on our side was actually decent? So there was an interesting line of questioning by Sam Alito and Neil Gorsuch and even some from Clarence Thomas who opened up the questioning of the government side, U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Preligar, who said, "Where they asked, where else and what other instances has this statute been applied during political protests or something that didn't involve tampering with evidence, documents or witnesses, which is in the entire 1512 criminal code? And of course, she had no answer to that. And uh, it was uh, Justice Alito who brought up some of the recent protests, including, and you'll love this, Jesse, Jamal Bowman's pulling of the fire alarm that delayed an important congressional vote. He actually brought that up. And she astonishingly said that those examples would not rise to the level of the J6 1512C2 prosecutions. She didn't really have a good explanation why, because you know why, Jesse, she's not gonna say, well, this isn't gonna apply to our side. This isn't gonna apply to Democrats and our protesters. It's only going to apply to uh, Republicans, conservatives, or Trump supporters. So I think that was very illuminating to the justices to see how they have weaponized the broad and vague language in the statute to only apply to a certain uh, segment of uh, the American people. Okay, let's move on. There's sadly too much I have to get to here. What impact does this have on Trump's January 6th case. He's got a January 6th case floating out there with that piece of trash, Jack Smith. Is this going to affect that? It is. See, Jesse, you're way smarter than you give yourself credit for. So yes, <laughs> this count represents two of the four counts in Jack Smith's criminal indictment against Donald Trump for the events of January 6th. So if the Supreme Court comes back and basically says, official proceeding, which is the language, relates to a judicial proceeding or an investigation, not a function of Congress, then not only will this exonerate 350 plus J6ers, but also it would basically end what Jack Smith has accused Donald Trump of with those two 15-2 related counts in his January 6th criminal indictment. So will he drop those counts? Um, obviously, if the Supreme Court comes back, uh, Donald Trump will go back and ask for those counts to be dropped out of his indictment. What Jack Smith does after that, who knows, he could bring a superseding indictment with other counts. But this does have a big impact, not just on this, but also there's 1512C2 counts in his um, classified documents indictment against Donald Trump and two co-defendants as well. So this will have large reaching repercussions uh, to both the January 6th prosecution and special counsel Jack Smith. Okay, how does this, or does any of this, I know, another dumb question, does it, any of this affect his New York trial he's going through right now? Everyone's covering it, everyone's talking about it, the Alvin Bragg thing, he's not allowed to criticize, he has to be there every day. Does any of this affect that? 
not related to what happened in the Supreme Court today, but it will impact what's happening in the classified documents case in Florida because the fact that Donald Trump will have to be in this courtroom in New York for six to eight weeks every day. Judge Aileen Cannon has made it very clear that she will allow and she will defend Donald Trump's right as a defendant to participate in all of the court hearings and to prepare his own defense. So this Alvin Bragg eight, six, eight week charade debacle will impact Jack Smith's classified documents case in Florida because she has already made clear that she will protect Donald Trump's rights to participate in his defense. And as this continues to move towards uh, a trial date, which we don't have yet, there's still a lot of pretrial things going on. Uh, this will certainly delay major parts of preparing that case to go to trial sometime maybe later this summer. Okay, Julie, just give us the overall point of view here. Is Donald Trump, we used to think he was going to end up in the slammer before the election. Now, we've caught a whole lot of breaks here between the Supreme Court, Fannie Willis not being able to keep okay. her pants on. We've caught a lot of breaks here. Do we think that we've caught enough that at least we're going to avoid that? Well, in terms of what we have talked about in Donald Trump going to trial, especially in Washington on the January 6th case, this will really all hinge on more oral arguments next Thursday, April 25th. And that will be the oral arguments in the presidential immunity matter. The question as to whether Donald Trump or any president is immune from criminal prosecution for his conduct in office. Those will be explosive oral arguments next Thursday, and it really will dictate what the Supreme Court comes back with. If they deny Donald Trump's claims of presidential immunity, then the trial in Washington can restart. And that does pose a chance that Donald Trump could be uh, on trial in Washington uh, before the election or inconceivably even on election day if those proceedings restart based on the Supreme Court's uh, decision in that question. Uh, on election day, yeah, Lee. Julie, yeah. thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it as always. All right, lawfare. You remember that whole Fed napping hoax, right? Julie's actually talked to us about that many, many times, where the FBI created their own kidnapping plot. <laughs> well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that little update. Before we get to that, let's talk about this. 4.8%. At the end of this year, you will be 4.8% poorer than you were last year. That's what the inflation numbers look like now. If they stay where they are year over year, 4.8%. We're just watching our value, our standard of living go down and down and down. And we feel powerless, but we're not powerless. Yeah, you're powerless to save the dollar. You can't do that. You're powerless to control the Fed and the spending. And th there's very little that you or I can do about that. But we can make preparations. Just because the plane happens to be going down doesn't mean we're out of parachutes. Do you have precious metals? You know, this is a basic, basic preparation everyone should make, right? And that's what Oxford Gold, Oxford Gold Group is about. It's for normal people to make basic preparations. You don't have to go crazy. Don't go crazy. Let Oxford get some gold or silver coins in your hands. Let them get it in your retirement, your IRA, your 401k. Let them get you ready for whatever it is that's coming. But it is coming. Call. Tell them I told you to call. They'll take care of you. 833-995-GOLD. We'll be back. Today, Attorney General Dana Nessel was joined by officials from the Department of Justice and the FBI to announce state and federal charges against 13 members of two militia groups who were preparing to kidnap and possibly kill me. It was just literally a bunch of working class guys who on the weekend got together and you know, exercised their rights and trained with firearms. So the FBI says, hey, we'll just pay for everything. Who arranged the meeting? The FBI's paid provocateur. Robeson was getting paid to set this stuff up. So they make the route, they set the locations, they make the plan, 
they do everything, and Adam's literally just sitting in the basement of a vacuum repair shop smoking blunts all day. The whole goal was for the FBI to spend millions of dollars to create militia groups, record them saying offensive stuff, and then frame them in a fake conspiracy. I'm excited for this. We've been talking about this story for a while. It is eye-popping, and it's amazing how many Americans don't know about it. Joining me now, the lady responsible for that incredible film, which you should go watch, Christina Urso. She is the director and producer of Kidnap and Kill. She's also a journalist. Okay, Christina, for those, maybe it's their first night tuning into I'm Right. Maybe they haven't seen your wonderful film yet. Why don't you give us a little background on this kidnapping plot, I remember it like it was yesterday. Woke up one day, it's an election year, look at my phone, oh my gosh, they were gonna kidnap and kill Gretchen Whitmer, that's crazy. What was the real story? Well, the official story, right, was in October of 2020, a group of 14 men were arrested and six were charged federally with conspiracy to kidnap. Eight were hit with state charges of providing material support. They said that these men were part of two different militia groups that were planning to kidnap Whitmer, um, like take her from her vacation cottage, um, maybe do something to her security detail, uh, take her over the lake and put her on trial in Wisconsin. Um, that was the official story. And then as this case went to trial and discovery started to come out, uh, the true story was very different. And uh, I can go into that as far as how this whole thing comes together, because it doesn't come together without the FBI being involved every step of the way. Yes, I would prefer you go into that. I want I, the take as much time as you need. I want the American people to know what exactly is going on with their secret state police agency. Right. So going back to the time frame, I mean, people need to remember what was going on in 2020. Uh, we had the pandemic and we had a bunch of lockdowns. Michigan had the harshest lockdown. So this is the backdrop, right? There's also the summer of love. We're having mostly peaceful protests. And uh, you have a bunch of guys who are sitting around. They can't really work, so they've got nothing really to do. And the FBI had certain people they were monitoring online, um, and they essentially brought these individuals together. Uh, they infiltrated a group called the Wolverine Watchmen. Um, this was not initially a militia group. It was more of like a prepper group that was kind of mostly online, right? It was created online um, in November of 2019, by March of 2020, the FBI has not only infiltrated the group, uh, but their informant, Dan Chappell, becomes the leader, uh, effectively, of this group. And then other various people that the FBI had been monitoring and kind of targeting, they then come together because the FBI calls meetings for these militia groups and then pays for the meetings. They arranged uh, FTXs, which is called a field training exercise. This is things that militia groups do. Uh, they do defensive firearms training. They do medical training, things of this nature. And so throughout the course of 2020, throughout the summer, the FBI is creating these events, paying for them, and using a network of 12 informants. And then later on, they introduce two to three undercover agents to bring this group together and to try to get something off the ground, basically. But there was never really a plot. Um, you had the FBI's informants uh, getting people intoxicated and then recording them saying offensive things. And then those little clips were played in court out of context to kind of create the appearance of a conspiracy where really none existed. You speak to a bunch of people in this documentary, and gosh, I have so many things I want to ask you, but what what made your jaw drop? I know you already knew the story before you started, but you always learn more as you dig into these things. What, what did someone say to you that made you go, oh my gosh, what? Well, okay, so I had actually covered the case from the time the arrest began in October of 2020. I knew right away with the way the media covered this that the true story is probably something different. And then it wasn't until actually after the first trial. So 
Uh, to kind of back this up, there were four trials in total. The first federal trial resulted in zero convictions for the government and uh, two acquittals. It was when I spoke to Brandon, I interviewed him after he was acquitted, and it wasn't until I talked to him that I realized there's so much about this story that people just don't know. Even if you were following along, even if you were listening in uh, to the public access line and following the trial that you wouldn't know about. So it wasn't until I began uh, doing the documentary that I realized that there's so much here. And there's, you know, honestly, this case, I think, is a microcosm for all of the things that we're seeing going wrong in America, right? We've got the Weaponization Committee. I'm not sure why they haven't looked into this case. There isn't really a greater example of weaponization than the Whitmer case, in my opinion. It also, there was certain events that happened during the course of the investigation where there's sort of like a, a January 6th connection, for example, where I feel like the Whitmer case was sort of a dry run for what happened later on. And I can explain that if you'd uh, like. Yes, please. I would like you to. What happened later on? Yeah. So um, throughout the course of the investigation, while the FBI is bringing these people together, right, during the summer of 2020, there are anti-lockdown rallies occurring in Michigan. Um, there's one that happens in April of 2020 at the Lansing uh, Capitol. And the FBI has their informant, who is now the leader of the Wolverine Watchmen group, He's got a couple of the members of the Watchmen with him. They're attending this anti-lockdown pro 2 a group. They're in their full kit with their firearms. And the FBI, by the way, is monitoring the entire thing uh, as this is happening. And their informant says on a wire, like, oh, I think these guys might be getting ready to do something. Well, the FBI tells the Lansing Capitol Police to stand down, open the doors and let everybody in. So they wanted them to go into the Capitol armed, right? Well, the guys stood in line. They went through COVID screening. They go in and then the media runs with these pictures of the watchmen inside the Capitol and running with the story of right wing militias storming the Capitol. They, you know, they were saying that they were looking for lawmakers and things like this. But the handling agent in Detroit at the time, the special agent in charge of the Detroit field office was a man named Stephen Dantuono. And he's overseeing this whole thing. This is a storming of the Capitol, you know, prior to January 6th. And one week after these men get arrested, October 7th of 2020, he's promoted by Christopher Ray from the head of the Detroit field office to be the assistant director of the Washington, D.C. field office. So he, there he is overseeing another storming of the Capitol. How about that? Christina, uh, this doesn't feel like a one-off to me. This feels like how the FBI does business. Maybe they've done it this way in the past and we didn't know. Maybe they intend to do this again in the future. Do you get the feeling they intend to do this again in the future? Maybe they're doing it as we speak. <laughs> yes, I think that they have a history of doing this, right? Uh, you can go back and look at COINTELPRO. You can look at PATCON for a more recent example. Um, but in uh, my investigation of the Whitmer case, it appears that the Whitmer uh, investigation actually has its origins in an earlier FBI operation that seemed to be going on in 2018, where the FBI was trying to infiltrate m different militia groups. Now, in the Whitmer case, uh, the FBI also is creating fake militia groups. This was something that, for people who aren't aware, one of their informants was posing as a head of a national, uh, of a militia group, and he was posing as a national commander. Um, the FBI claimed that there was this uh, nationwide meetup of militia groups in June of 2020, where they claimed the origins of the uh kidnapping plot began. Well, what they didn't say is that the FBI called and shared that meeting through their informant, who is also a convicted child sex offender. Uh, he calls and shares the meeting, and the meeting is all for targets, that people that the FBI is targeting, to bring those people together. And then there's numerous informants there that are reporting everything that is being said. And um, they're trying to instigate, they're trying to get people to talk about things they're you know, saying like, they're in your backyard, you got to give them no quarter, they're talking about you can't just take brick and mortar, like their informants are repeatedly suggesting things. 
and then other people are not going along with their suggestions. So the FBI is creating their own militia groups. Um, some of the things in this case, like one of the informants was posing as the head of the Tennessee chapter for, again, a fake group that doesn't exist outside of the FBI's fabrication. The main target of their investigation was a vulnerable man named Adam Fox. He, at the time, was homeless. He was living in the basement of a vacuum repair shop at a place called the Vac Shack. And um, they set upon him and they've got numerous informants suggesting things to him and uh, trying to essentially get him to become a leader. Well, he's not a leader of anything. He's not really part of any militia group. He wasn't a member of the Wolverine Watchmen. The FBI made him a member and then they created uh, a fake chapter for their fake militia group. They told Adam he was the head of the Michigan chapter of the Patriot Three Percenters. And then Adam inducts the informant Dan Chapel, the other informant, as the commanding officer, again, of this fake militia group. And then the huh, FBI which... is saying, well, you know, he cre he was the leader of this militia group. And it's like, it doesn't exist, though, outside of your fabrication. You have an informant posing as a national commander. Your other informants are posing as different heads of different state chapters of various militia groups. I mean, they created a Facebook page for this Michigan chapter of a fake militia group. That was the FBI who was creating and administering it. Um, they use what they call online covert employees or OCEs that are running fake identities online to try to get people into these groups and then funnel them into events like this where the FBI can try to find a reason to manufacture something, to get something off the ground. They try to target people who are more vulnerable, who might be more suggestible, that will go along with things that the FBI is suggesting. So yes, they have a history of doing this and um, they've not been held accountable for any of the things that happened in this case. So there's no reason to believe they wouldn't still be doing these things. They've got yeah. every reason to no, do but... so. Uh, and I think that they get paid for these things. They have financial incentives to keep manufacturing things that they can then foil and congratulate themselves for. Yeah, they always find the morons and take advantage of them. All right, Christina, really, really quickly, where can people watch your documentary? Uh, the website is knkfilm.com. Um, the film has not yet been released. We are still uh, going through the process of putting together because this is such a big story. There's 14 different defendants, 20 unindicted co-conspirators, all of their family, um, and four different trials that we're trying to condense into one. So we're still putting it all together. But if people want to watch the trailer, they can do so on our website and just bookmark it. You'll get um, updates from us through that of when it's going to be officially released. KNKfilm.com. Christina, outstanding work. Thank you, ma'am. All right. We're not done yet. Someone's going after the communists. We'll talk to him in a moment. Before we do that, let's talk to you about this, about your sore feet. At the end of the day, your feet bother you, don't they? Very common. It's not like you're abnormal, honestly. It happens to one of my sons has it. So what do you do? Well, what you need, you need orthotics. What you need is better shoes. Honestly, so but what shoes do you buy? Everyone's got an advertisement for it out there. What you need is gravity defier. Gravity defier. First, you should understand it's going to come with custom orthotics for you. Second, you need to understand you're dealing with patented technology here. So at the end of the day, that heel that bothers you, the left front part of your foot, that, that goes away. That doesn't happen anymore. These things are life-changing. Is that too far? Probably not, though. You want a pair? You do. Here's what you need to do. You need to go to gdefy.com. gdefy.com. Use the promo code JESSE to save you a bunch of money. All right? We'll be back. Mr. Washington, can you quickly tell me uh, what airspace requires an ADSB transponder? Not sure I can answer that question right now. So what are the six types of special use airspace that protect this national security that appear on FAA charts? Uh, sorry, Senator, I cannot answer that question. Okay, so what are the operational limitations of a pilot flying under basic med? Senator, I'm not a pilot, so... So can you tell me what causes an aircraft to spin or to stall? 
Uh, again, Senator, I'm not a pilot. That gentleman was trying to be the head of the FAA. The FAA seems to be a fairly important institution, doesn't it? After all, those planes in the sky, we don't want them dropping out of the sky, do we? So what kind of hiring are they doing over there? Joining me now, William Trackman, General Counsel at Mountain States Legal. William, could you please enlighten us? What exactly are the qualifications they're using at the FAA, being as how that's such an important job with life and death and all that? Well, the FAA clearly isn't sending their best, obviously. Uh, here we have a situation where even at the highest level of the FAA, uh, this is someone who is nominated uh, to take charge. Uh, my firm, Mountain States Legal Foundation, has a lawsuit related to air traffic controllers, which is a separate hiring process, obviously. And in that process, they had a pre-employment test, and they looked at the results of the pre-employment test and decided that too many white people passed the test, and so they would flush that test and adopt a new one, uh, that would gerrymander the racial pool and create, a, I guess, a more favorable racial balance uh, for the White House. And in our case, we represent over 900 would-be air traffic controllers who lost their schooling uh, opportunities, they lost their career opportunities because they couldn't pass the new test, over 900 of them. Some of them passed with 100% in the initial go-around, and then they couldn't pass uh, the new test that was adopted by the FAA. So we are suing over race discrimination, and uh, we're looking forward to prevailing and making it so that this can't happen again. I'm looking forward to you prevailing as well. Exactly how long has this kind of insanity gone on, at least to your discovery so far, in the airline industry? Is this something that happened start or started six months ago? Has it been years in the making? It's been going on a while, uh, probably a decade at this point. Under the Obama administration, these were the sorts of initiatives they were adopting in order to uh, get at quote-unquote diversity within the air traffic controller hiring pool. But just in the last year or two, I think we've all seen this DEI effort ramp up. We've seen airlines announce that they're going to make sure that 50% of pilots are women. We've seen videos online of uh, all non-white staff on airplanes saying, look how diverse we are. And then, of course, we've just got a number of incidents lately uh, that involve disasters on airplanes like the Alaska Airlines flight that indicate that merit is not at the top of the list and that instead people are obsessed with race, they're obsessed with gender, things that ought not matter. Uh, you start, I certainly couldn't care less about the race or gender of the pilot in the cockpit or the air traffic controller on the ground when I go from point A to point B. But that really is something that people in, white, in the White House obsess about. They, they constantly think, how are we going to make this pool of employees better reflect the exact racial demographics of the country when that qualification has nothing to do with your skill, merit, competence, experience. And so it's actually creating lives on the line here. No one has stepped up and said, uh, maybe we should keep it merit based. <laughs> yeah, you don't say like this is a pretty important field, right? You know, it's one thing to tinker and socially engineer the workforce in an HR department on the ground. It's quite another thing to put all of our lives at risk by hiring people who aren't the most qualified. Now, if you ask the Biden White House, what's your defense? They'll say, well, the old test really disadvantaged racial, racial minorities. It had uh, an impediment, a barrier. And all we were doing was getting rid of that barrier by adopting a new test called the biographical assessment. But if there's one thing that I couldn't care less about, it's the biography of the air traffic controller. I mean, just the title of the test itself, biographical assessment, is ominous uh, because it relates more to your story, your narrative, your background, than the actual important thing if you're, become, if you're gonna become an air traffic controller, which is your merit, your skill, your competence, your experience. Uh, and none of those things were at the top of the list for the FAA. And e even today, we don't think that they are. You're also going to bat for farmers. In a, in a different case, you're going to bat for farmers. What exactly is going on there? What did, what did the Biden White House try to do? So in contrast to the FAA case, which started under the Obama administration, uh, and where we have to pour over you know, hundreds of thousands of documents and interview witnesses, the Biden White House had no such embarrassment about just enacting a program with facial uh, racial preferences uh, for disaster relief. So we represent farmers in Texas who suffered natural disasters and were entitled to various federal benefits under COVID-19, uh, relief programs, 
but the amount of relief that they got was less because they were not uh, a racial minority or um, in most cases, not women. So the Biden administration enacted farm relief plans and then its own USDA officials decided that they would dole out that relief based on race and sex. And here it wasn't even as though Congress asked them to do that. USDA just unilaterally decided that's the best way to dole out farm aid. Uh, And so we're suing under the Equal Protection Clause. And we just filed uh, very recently a motion for a preliminary injunction, which would halt the program even before it's finished. And we like our chances. Yeah, I like your chances in that one, too. Fingers crossed for you, William. Thank you for doing what you do. I appreciate it, sir. Thanks so much, Jesse. All right. We've got light in the mood. Next. All right, it is time to lighten the mood. And this is kind of one of those who do you root for situations here in this lighten the mood. On one hand, everyone, is, everyone understands my thoughts on the elderly. I love them. I believe in society they should be cherished, listened to. They have so much wisdom. And I believe in being respectful to them. At the same time, some people, not many, not many because the bitter people don't generally live to be that old, but some people just get more and more horrible every single year they're alive. And, well, this 11-year-old kid ran into Granny from hell at the game. Such a savage burn. So simple. Get a life. (laughs) Everyone cheers. All right. I'll see you tomorrow.